Hey everyone, welcome to day 16, 16th of September of Aisha Back to School 2021. Um, my name is Martin Copeland and I'm going to be talking to you about FinOps on Microsoft Azure. So very quickly, just a little bit of information about me. Uh, so I'm a Microsoft MVP um, in Azure and also uh, an MCT as well. Um, I'm an ambassador with the DevOps Institute as as well as doing a lot of development around cloud native uh, technology. So be that with containers, uh, functions, and also things like Cosmos database and um, APIs uh, and such and such. Um, uh, very lucky to be um, uh, twice now a, a published author. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Um, you can go on Amazon and check out uh, the books that, that I got available um, there. Um, I'm also lucky enough to also speak at various different conferences as well and different user groups and, and events such as this one. Uh, and I'm a fairly frequent uh, blogger as well and you can find uh, a lot of the stuff uh, that I do online there. So before we get into um, looking at FinOps or, on Azure and looking at how we can get various different elements of cost information out of Azure, right? I want to first talk to you about what exactly FinOps is and how we can um, start to understand this concept and, and really build on it and do more with it with Azure. So first of all, <coughs> excuse me, what is FinOps? So at its core, really, FinOps is a cultural practice. Okay, so it's the way for teams to be able to manage their cloud costs. And this is where everyone takes ownership of their cloud usage um, and it's supported by a set of best practices. And that's often a central group that support that. So cross-functional teams across IT, finance, and also product management um, and various other teams as well will work together to make sure that you can enable faster product delivery while at the same time gaining financial control and predictability. If you think of the one biggest thing that, that I talk to customers about and I hear about in the community, it's always about the predictability of costs and understanding your costs in the cloud. As flexible as the cloud is, one of the things that it's actually given us in terms of a problem is it's a lot harder to predict the costs that we're going to be spending in the cloud. Uh, and that's really where FinOps comes in to be able to help answer some of those questions. So there are six principles of FinOps that, that are important to understand. And uh, we're gonna go through these now and, and talk about them in, in a little bit as well. So first and foremost, it's around the need to collaborate and teams needing to talk to each other and work effectively together. So if you think of things like DevOps and DevSecOps where we, we preach and talk around collaboration, this is exactly the same as well. In fact, FinOps does sit under that umbrella um, that we would call XOps, which includes anything like DevOps, Data Ops, AI Ops, uh, DevSecOps, all of them will all fit together, and GitOps would also fit into there as well. So this is really around keeping all of those things within the same umbrella. Um, but the same principle there applies here as well. There is a need to make sure that we can collaborate and there is a need to make sure that everyone is on the same page when it comes to the goals that you're trying to achieve. One of the other principles as well is around business value of cloud driving decisions. So it's really important not to lose sight of what the business value of cloud is to your business and making sure that that drives the decisions you make within your cloud platform. Because okay, so we're gonna to touch on that a little bit more as we get further into the session. <laughs> the next one is around everyone taking ownership of their cloud usage. So it sounds like a real obvious thing, but you'd be surprised how many organizations don't do this. And really this is around making sure that application groups or product groups effectively take ownership of what they spend in the cloud and take ownership of reducing that cost wherever possible if it's too high. And also making sure that you are able to um, align your cloud usage with business value. You know, sometimes you will spend more than your budget. It could be that your budget's not right. Um, FinOps doesn't practice that you should optimize and reduce everything. It says that you should optimize it to a level that's acceptable to your business. 
So reports within FinOps should also be very timely and accessible. It's no good having the same report delivered on different days of each month um, or each quarter, depending on what the report is. It's also very important that they're accessible to everyone. You know, a report is a report. It shouldn't be hidden away just for people in a specific group to be able to see what that is and, and not others. It should be transparent. The last one as well is that a centralised team should drive FinOps. So this is a team that you would make up of, again we talked about it a little bit earlier, IT professionals, finance professionals and product professionals. So when we say a centralised team, it might not be their primary role. In fact, in some organisations, it might be people from within other teams, especially smaller organisations. Key thing is this is a practice. Uh, this is not specifically a, a specific team. So in smaller organisations, you would be absolutely fine with bringing members of your other teams into this practice to be able to really drive this forward. <clears throat> One of the last things as well is being able to take advantage of the variable cost model of cloud. So certainly for some services in the cloud, you get tiered benefits. The more you spend, the cheaper pay unit it gets. So storage is potentially one of those things, um, especially in a CSP model. Um, but in other scenarios, it may well be that you actually <coughs> have various different variables within your cost model, such as the ability to use hybrid use benefit, reserved instances, that you must start taking advantage of to be able to start realizing cost benefits. Um, the cloud is definitely not a platform where you fire and forget like we're used to in on-premises environments. It's definitely one where continual tweaking and continual review is needed of your environment to make sure that you are getting the best possible costs and the best possible performance out of your platform. So who are the key stakeholders when it comes to FinOps? So from the executive level, you will be looking at VPs or heads of your infrastructure and operations team, as well as the CTO um, or the CIO, whichever your organization has. From a product perspective, the director of cloud and the cloud analyst may be involved, as well as anyone involved with business operations. And then from a finance perspective, anyone involved with a procurement from a technology perspective, and yeah, financial business advisors, and also anyone involved in strategic sourcing would also be someone that's beneficial to be um, involved with the FinOps processes. And then from an engineering perspective, any principals or leads as well as architects and engineering managers are, are also key stakeholders from the engineering side as well. And these are all people that have a vested interest in making sure that the platform is as optimum as possible from various different angles of cost. So next, I want to talk to you about the capability architecture of, of FinOps. And this is really three areas where um, you can start to make differences within your organisation to start giving people the best possible outcome. So first, so first of all, to explain, it's split up into three areas, inform, optimise and operate. So inform is around giving you visibility and um, for the allocation of and also creating shared accountability by showing teams what they're spending and why they're spending it. So it's really important thing to make sure that people are informed and understand and that helps to create that accountability. Next is around optimise. And this is around empowering teams to identify and also measure efficiency optimizations and then make goals based on those opportunities. And then finally, it's around operate. This is around defining and executing processes which then enable the goals of everyone involved, so technology, finance, and the business to be achieved. And those are three really key areas. <coughs> so let's have a look at some of these in a little bit more detail. So all the way back to inform, the first thing is around understanding your costs. So this is where we'll do things like setting your tagging strategy and also your compliance for tags, creating models around showback and chargeback and the reporting aspects of that. Quite a lot of people really struggle with the ability to show back costs within the business. And it's really important that we do that. And for a number of reasons, really. First of all, we need to make sure that people understand exactly what we're spending and how we're spending that money. Um, 
and people need to understand that it is not a deploy what you want scenario. You know, when you deploy something in the cloud, there is direct cost um, to that, and that needs to be understood. And that's where accountability comes in as well. Also mapping spending data to the business. So that's something that's really important as well, as well as defining budgets and forecasts. You know, we need to, we need to set a budget, we need to set a realistic budget, not just a, a pie in the sky number or an estimate. We need to set something that's realistic. And then we need to forecast to help determine when we're gonna breach that budget or if we're gonna get close to that budget. It could be that the budget's wrong. It could be that the budget's unrealistic to start with, but it's important that budgets exist and that forecasts exist to be able to help create more meaningful budgets in the future. In terms of understanding costs as well, we also need to dynamically calculate any custom rates and amortization metrics. So amortization is a really important thing um, in, in finance, especially. But that applied into the cloud in, in quite simple terms is if you take a, a reserved instance on a virtual machine, for example, the amortized cost would be spreading the cost of that in, instead of paying for it all up front, like you might do with a reserved instance, it's spreading that cost evenly over the life of the reserved instance. So your amortized costs give you a more realistic look at what your costs actually are over that monthly period. So even though you're not paying specifically for that resource monthly, because it's got a reservation against it, um, that we pay for annually or over three years, we're actually spreading the cost over a 12 month or a three year period to get a more accurate view of what we're spending. And, and that's what amortized metrics are, are all about. So lastly, in inform, it's on benchmarking. Okay, we, we need to know where we are and we need to know how we're doing so creating scorecards metrics and kpis and also benchmarking both internally against other teams and against industry peers where applicable will help you give an idea of where your financial performance is um, don't read too much into it against other teams internally because every application is different and certainly within your industry the way you do things although it might be similar to another organization it, it's likely to be done slightly differently. So don't read too much into that, but it gives you an idea. Around benchmarking as well, we can look at things like trending and also variance analysis, analysis sorry, and have a look at some of the metrics around there. And, but benchmarking is really important because we can't improve unless we are understanding where we are from a benchmarking perspective. And that is something that is really important to understand. Once you benchmark, that's when you can make judgments and improvements to what you are doing. If you don't understand your fundamental benchmark, you can't look to improve in the future. <clears throat> okay, so moving across to optimize. Now, this is around making real-time decisions and then optimizing your usage. So these are things that you'll be more familiar with, with working with cloud environments, hopefully. So the ability to both find and remove underutilized services and provide uh, both timely and consistent spending data are really key to making real-time decisions and making uh, giving people the ability to make those real-time decisions. It's no good really, um, certainly from my opinion, to be able to um, provide that data sporadically and at different times of the month because that prevents giving teams the ability to make proper decisions. And it's those proper decisions over the course of quarters and years that will start to reflect your costs a bit more widely and a bit more broadly. And then around optimizing. So hopefully everyone's familiar with the practice of uh, right sizing and workload management where we can resize and utilize resources and manage the workloads effectively through periods of low and high demand. Um, and we can do that through automation. Automation is a key part of, of the optimised phase. Yes, it can be done manually, but optimising through automa automation gives us the ability to react and be proactive at the same time. We can use the same processes to preemptively um, look at spend data and say, yes, we need more demand for the coming period, or we can react to performance metrics of virtual machines. Last but not least is around operate, and again, from a financial perspective, this is around utilizing the marketplace, okay? And it's around optimizing your licensing. So making sure you make use of high reduced benefit. 
and making sure you utilize any licenses you have in your software uh, assurance agreement and making sure that you apply them into your environment. It's around making sure that discounts match flexibility as well. So Flex RIs, uh, Flex Reservations in Azure are a great example of this instead of buying one-to-one -one mappings. This is a great example because this lets you go off and say you want to purchase reservations for a specific family and that's something that really helps as well. <coughs> because that gives you, excuse me, the flexibility to be able to pick instance sizes rather than be fixed to specific um, SKUs and that's, that's something that's really important as well. Next is around agile plans to the business. So this lets you create business cases and also develop a communication strategy and then also start to develop your framework for decision making that aligns with any business drivers. Okay, so this is a really important thing as well. So remember operators around defining and executing process which enables all of the goals of both technology and finance as well as the business to also be uh, achieved as well. So it's a really important part of the step. Um, but you have to be agile. Um, if you're not agile, you become obviously fixed by, by definition. And that, that fixed approach can have a detrimental effect, especially in the cloud. Okay, so with that, um, it's now time to look, <coughs> excuse me, at Azure Cost Management and really see um, how some of this data is presented and how we can use it to be able to uh, get useful information out of um, what we're spending and use that information to be able to make cost-based decisions. Okay, so Azure Cost Management is, is just accessed in, in any normal way like any other Azure service. So there are a couple of ways to go into it. So you can go in through subscriptions and then when you're into your subscription, uh, you can go into cost analysis and it will load up the cost analysis section and you can look at a subscription level. Azure Cost Management is all around scope. So it's around looking at different scopes to be able to determine and drive data. So it's really, really important to make sure that you have the ability to look at different levels. And with that, you could also go into resource groups as well. So you could go into a resource group at this level and within your resource group, you can also then go into cost analysis at the same place as well. Uh, so we just wait for the portal to load. So again, you can go down to cost analysis um, underneath cost management. And one of the things you'll notice this time is that the scope is different. So the scope is looking at now a resource group rather than an overall subscription. Um, and you can filter back um, within here to various different, excuse me, various different views and see uh, what your costs are and also any forecasts as well. Um, obviously you need to have some data in and it does depend on the type of subscription that you're using as well. Um, so bear in mind that certain types of subscriptions don't support either cost management currently. Um, so sponsorship subscriptions would definitely be uh, one of those. Um, but one of the other things that you can do as well is you can also go into cost management as a separate uh, resource as well. So cost management and billing would um, be able to load at this level as well. And you can go into cost management as a separate tool and you can change the scope at this level. You could look again at a subscription level and you'd be back to the first view effectively. And this would give you a, a, a different look at, at what's happening. So you can see that we've picked the scope again. And um, so that's been set to uh, the subscription and you can see what the costs are over time. So the actual cost to date will appear in this uh, darker green color <coughs> and then the lighter color uh, are basically what your forecasted costs are. So you have both actual and forecast on the same chart. And um, so that's something that's really important as well. If you look further down, you will see the breakdown here um, by service name. So you can see that we're taking up a, a significant portion of our overall costs in, in storage at the minute. Then Azure App Services, Virtual Machines, Azure Bastion and, and so on and so forth. 
You could also look via location as well. So you can see for this subscription, uh, UK South is the predominant location that's set and then you can look per resource group as well. So you can see which resource group is taking up the most uh, costs here and that will uh, ultimately go around and, and cycle around various different bits and pieces. There's various different things that you can do to this chart. So if you go into the grouping information and um, you're able to look at different things to be able to group together. Um, now one of the interesting ones that you can do uh, in here is um, where are we? Uh, is by service name. So if you group by service name, um, that will actually go off and refresh the, the chart that's in here. And when the data comes back, we will get a similar view. Um, except this will be driven um, overall by, you can see the, the legend at the bottom here, all the different service names that we have deployed within our uh, subscription. And if you hover, <coughs> excuse me, hover over at different points, you can see what the costs were and you can see what they were for individual things there. One thing that this doesn't do is this doesn't break down your forecasted costs by um, the same grouping and um, it just shows it as an overall forecast so you can see that there's no information there it only shows actual data you can also look at daily data as well so daily data is a view that will show you your daily forecast as well as your daily spend over time and you can draw it in different types of graphs as well so you can see there's a stats column chart and one of the things you can actually tell um, here is that we're, we're on a downward trend so why this chart is so useful is visually and very easily and um, you can see here that our daily costs are generally trending down and our forecasted costs are also trending down as well so that's, that's obviously a good thing um, and you would see the same thing if you put a line chart on as well one important thing to notice is you can see that the 6th of September here is showing 37 so um, you know that was uh, that was obviously uh, a, a Monday the 6th of September um, but one of the things to bear in mind is uh, where you are in the world and how often this data is refreshed so this data is only refreshed every day every 24 hour period and that is around about midnight to 2am pacific time in the United States so for me in the UK um, that's anywhere between excuse me, um, 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. I've known it go a little bit further around 10 a.m. but your costs will not update until that period. Um, so that's a, an important thing to, to notice is that you're missing some data here. You know, we'd expect that to be further up uh, towards the 45, 46 mark. So if I was to come and look at this later, you would see that that would be the case and then today would be showing as a lower number. So it's important to you know, ultimately discount the last 24 hour period because the, the cost data will be incomplete depending on your time offset from uh, Pacific time. So that's something that's important to understand. <coughs> okay, one other thing that is important in here as well is the ability to filter by tags. So the ability to filter by tags is important because we can use tags to add things like cost centers um, add things like workload names across different resource groups and various different things. So I can look at a workload name in here and it will load up, excuse me, all of the tags that are in my uh, subscription. So I can look at anything tagged with workload name, cloud management platform, and this will redraw the graph to show the same data but scoped to that specific tag value. So you can see that the costs have been relatively uh, low, around a pound a day, uh, and they are all driven by um, Azure Front Door as a service, and they all belong to one resource group. That obviously might not be the case, depending on your configuration and environment. Um, but that's an important thing to look at as well. That's an important thing to consider. <coughs> so let's move on to cost alerts. So cost alerts are what really help you um, provide information uh, uh, around you know, you know via email around your current spend so you can specify brand new cost alerts by entering in your unique name and also the reset period how often do we want the reset period to reset monthly quarterly or, or annually and what do we want it to be scoped to as well 
So we can add a name in for this and we can say that the creation date is uh, now. We want that to be quarterly. And I want the threshold to be, um, say, 300. So one of the things you'll see here is that the budget is set at 300. And you can see that we're, we're, we're clearly going to break that. One thing that this tool does do is based on the um, forecast, I don't know if you just saw that there very briefly, but it suggested um, what that pricing might be. Uh, let's move this back to monthly so we can see that in a bit more detail again. It suggests based on forecast data uh, exactly what we should uh, set it to as a suggested value. So let's let this redraw um, itself up again. And that will help you drive decisions. So if you're if you're looking at this with historical data and you're not really sure, in all honesty, what it should be set to, um, then this is a really valuable thing that will will help you. So if we set this to um, one thousand six hundred, you will see that that's that's probably much more like it as it's starting to come down. Uh, these costs have come down, so you can see that this is probably a a, a fair level there. You can then set um, forecasted targets. So when we're at 80% um, threshold, we can set an action group um, and we can manage that action group. So we can use action groups in the same way we would in Action Monitor. Um, we can also specify email addresses to send to this too as well and also language. And you'll get a nice formatted email um, giving you various different bits of, of information. <coughs> Budgets work in a very similar way. Okay, so budgets and alerts work in, a, in the same sort of way. And um, you'll notice that the screen here is very similar. If I add um, that information in, um, I can also set filters as well. So I can look in here and set filters for the various different um, categories. And um, one thing you can't do is set uh, budgets based on tags. So that's one thing that is currently um, not available to do. Um, but that information again is something that's really useful for you to be able to see. And um, if you think of our conversation earlier on in the presentation around um, the ability to use things like budgets to be able to make those financial decisions and understanding your costs and, and understanding where your applications and your cloud presence sits in terms of budget is really, really important. So that is one thing that shouldn't be underestimated. So one other thing that I didn't show you, I'm just going to go back um, to here, is um, I'm going to show you the ability here to um, look at cost analysis data. And this cost analysis data can also be um, exported as well. So um, if you have your various different information, so let's change this to a, um, a line chart, let's just give it a, give it a refresh. So if you want to analyze this information in more detail, um, I don't think it's going to load sadly. Um, it's having a few um, issues typically um, as I uh, record a presentation with a demo of it. But um, if you go to download once your data is loaded, um, you then have the ability to actually go look at that data um, in a CSV and look at it at granular level. Um, so that's really good for a more detailed analysis. It's also really good if you have your own financial planning tool or automation that can take in CSV files and give you additional information. So you can interact with Power BI, for instance, to actually cost management and get some, um, build some charts and get some interesting information through there. But one of the things that you can also do is download that data raw and do your own analysis in maybe a different tool or your own custom Power BI report. So it will give you some information and give you some insights into what your cloud spend is. One of the things you're also able to see in here is any advisor recommendations. So Azure Advisor is great and it's also free and it will give you cost recommendations around <clears throat> what things are within your environment that can help save you money. So this is actually telling us that we could save around $1,494 a year by buying reservations for virtual machines. And if you click into here, it tells you 
what the potential savings are and what the virtual machines are and what the recommended quantity is. Uh, and you can actually go um, through here and you can click that link and it will actually take you to the purchase reservation screen and, and bring up a, a, a B2 um, reservation which is which this one was for. So that's a really useful tool as well. You can also see any active reservations from here as well uh, and go buy them from there if you wanted to. And lastly, one of the great features is also, <clears throat> not specifically around Azure, but if you are in a multi-cloud environment um, and you have the ability to be able to um, bring costs together, because your FinOps practice should look across clouds. It shouldn't be a FinOps practice for your Azure presence and a FinOps practice for your AWS um, uh, cloud, but it should be one for all. So you can add a connector into Azure cost management um, that will actually, um, once you fill these inf bits of information in, <coughs> excuse me, it will actually provide your cost data in the same place as your actual cost data as well and bring it together. Um, one thing to note is from the billing of this. So for the first 90 days, you get a free trial of the connector effectively. And then after that period, you are charged 1% of your AWS costs under cost management. So if you're bringing in AWS data, and you are actually charged for that. So that's one thing to be uh, mindful of. But those insights will give you that same level and especially bring them together. If you share cost centers and billing information across clouds, which you should have, then um, that's really valuable information to see in one place because that's something that will help you over time and get a better handle on your costs. And then last but not least is exports. So you can schedule exports of your billing data and um, out to a storage account. So you can um, give it a name. So we can say demo. Um, <coughs> we can look at either actual or amortized costs. So we, we talked about amortized costs earlier um, in the presentation. And then we can look at daily, weekly, or monthly, or one-time exports. So there's lots of different options available to us. So I'm gonna do a daily export of months to date costs. And um, I'm going to start that from the 7th of this month. And then as we go through, um, you can use a storage account. So you can create a brand new one wherever you want that to go. Or use an existing one um, if you have one. So you can just pick and uh, select the storage account that you want to use through there. And then when you go create that, it will list up in here and you will be able to run it into me, uh, you know, you'll be able to run it now if you want to not wait or then it will keep it run on a schedule. Um, and then you can also disable and enable and also remove any old um, exports as well. So that's a really useful thing to be able to see and do. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so with that, um, let's just flip back. So. That, that is actually a cost management. It's a very simple tool to use, but it's also very powerful. There's actually not a lot to show you, um, but the data that you get out of actually cost management is incredibly valuable and is something that will help you and your FinOps practice and get a hold of your cloud costs and do all of the things that we've talked about in the, uh, in the presentation. Um, so with that, um, I just want to close up. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in to watch this session. So this was day 16 um, of Azure Back to School in September 2021. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me on, on Twitter. And um, you can do that. My uh, handle is Mr. Coops. That's M-R-C-O-U-P-S. Um, but with that, um, once again, thank you for watching and goodbye.